Okay, well today is really about what you can do and what I hope you will consider doing. I talked about the printing press, how that was the first revolution, and now I'm going to talk about the Guyu Wiki world. I think the second revolution, and we really do need one in education. I showed this picture before of Jacob Bronowski with his grandchild, and uh, we assume that little boy is putting the cube through the square hole. That's not if easy. There's one little kid who every time picked up the, the cube, he tried to put it through the round hole. All the, tri the triangle pyramid went through the round hole. Didn't matter what the shape was, it was always the round hole. His mum realized this was going to be a problem. He wasn't going to get to FSU this way. Um, he would, might get to uh, uni uh, sort of, uh, University of Florida. But uh, anyway, the... Uh, he, Took him to see a psychiatrist, and the psychiatrist said, don't worry. I, the way I look at it, this kid only sees one solution, and there's a perfect career for someone who sees only one solution, whatever the problem is, and that's to be a politician. <laughs> anyway, the power of the media. And it is powerful, and uh, let's look at one that was most powerful for you. This is uh, a pamphlet by Thomas Paine, Common Sense. And about a quarter of a million of these were sold. And it was this particular document by a Brit from the town of Lewis, where we live three months a year, or based in the summer, who actually perhaps catalyzed the revolution. In common sense, he said it was time for these colonies to secede from the UK, from the Britain. And it was distributed and convinced a lot of people that this was the way forward. Half a million were, were sold to a population of only two and a half million. Unfortunately, Paine could not convince the Americans that they should renounce the biblical institution of human slavery. It was actually Lincoln who had read Paine's writings as a young man and had thus been inspired to struggle for that particular chain. And in fact, in our town of Lewis, there is Thomas Paine. He's a painting of him on the wall. I wish I could see the same painting in other cities because he was so important to the American Revolution. Science for everybody. Well, E equals MC squared. A biography of the world's most famous equation. I know Bodanis, and he is quite interesting because he told me this, that Cameron Diaz um, had been asked by an interviewer, was there anything that she really wanted to know? And she said, I really want to know what E equals MC squared means. And David was at a party the same day, he said, um, and he started to ask his friends about it. <clears throat> and he said, do you think she really meant it? And they said, yes, they did. They didn't know anything about it. And they really, really liked to know about it. And so he wrote a book on E equals MC squared. And it's a fantastic book. Great story. And it's quite a thrilling one. Well, science for everybody. Now I'm going to ask you, how many of you intend to have children? Let's put your hand up at some stage. How many of you think um, that you have the right to bring those children up as you wish. You all do. Interesting. I'm going to look at that question because it turns out to be quite an interesting one. Should parents have the right to teach their children that their classmates will go to hell because they are not of the same religion or have no religion? Okay. Should the state have the right? Here is an image that brings that question into sharper focus. See, my parents were refugees from Berlin in 1937. And this is what was going on in the classrooms. So I'm going to address that question because I want you to think about it very carefully. Because how you bring up your children is very important. I've had this advertisement ever since I first saw it. Let's play, play Protestants and Catholics. Gerald, if I were Prime Minister of Northern Ireland, this is how I'd solve our problems. First, I would split Northern Ireland into two parts. And I would put Protestants on one side and Catholics on the other. David, 14, I would pass a law saying that any Roman Catholic who set foot on the street to start trouble would be shot instantly and without mercy. I would starve them like rats until there wasn't one left in Northern Ireland. Now, I guarantee that's from parental teaching. All right? So we need to think carefully about it. This is Bo. This is off YouTube. Bo Drain of Topeka, Kansas is the very model of a cute, blonde seven-year-old and just full of energy. Pick it up and start the countdown. 
He, his six-year-old sister Faith and I had a ball recently in their backyard. But some things Bo had to say were astonishing, especially coming from the mouth of a second grader. I don't think you'll uh, go to heaven. I think you'll go to hell. Who goes to hell? Gays, fags, um, lots, hundreds and hundreds of Jews. This hate is coming from Bo's family. They belong to the infamous Westboro Baptist Church. Westboro preaches that because our country tolerates homosexuality, abortion, and divorce, all Americans are going to hell. The children of Westboro learn this message early, accompanying their parents to daily dem... Now stop there, you can watch the rest of it. Now it doesn't just stop there. In fact, this is from the UK television. As Muslims, we have a right to bring up our children in accordance with our beliefs, which have served us over the centuries well. Now, I give you the same right to bring up your children in the way that you want. What the rights of the children themselves? Well, the rights of the children come when, uh, when they are uh, as is, uh, they're old enough to understand the issues. Until they get to that age, it's the parents' responsibility. And Do you teach them that you may not share that. Be punished? You may not share that, but that is my religion. That is the way I've been brought up. And I, have, I bring that child into this world. I educate him. I give him everything. It's my right to make sure that I bring him. Uh, you can't understand it's school career state perspective or set of values uh, do any scripture or from uh, God being intimidated by, by, by God and indeed God in um, when that child that child growing up basically knows more about well knows more about their religion and when and um, as they grow up they learn about other religions and choose and uh, I, 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 are you saying that the fact that you're brought up within a religious faith doesn't prevent you being open-minded or adopting any religion or none? Not at all. It does not prevent me from um, oh, uh, being open to other religions. I, in fact, have, uh, have come to this country and chose to put the veil on. I have come to this country without a, head, um, a veil on. So, 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 not, so not so very wicked is the view. But what is the penalty for apostasy? What is the penalty for leaving the Muslim faith? Um, to be honest, I cannot back that point off. Dr. Mukadam, what is the penalty for apostasy? And, well, um, before... Uh, we well, keep well, coming down this apostasy. Well, well, give us a quick answer on what is the penalty for apostasy. Islamic country, you Sorry? very well know, if it's an Islamic country, then the Sharia is very clear. Apostasy, apostasy is dealt with the death penalty. Thank you, that's what I want to But what's, that, what's, the, what's the relevance between what happens in an Islamic country and Great Britain? I fear to see the connection. Okay, I see it. Fails to see the connection. Well, many of you know about Malala, and um, I, I think Sam Harris has written an article just recently in the last few days to say it's a very good thing that she didn't get the Peace Prize, which she probably should have got, because she'd be even more threatened than she is at the present time. So those are the issues, and it's something to do with indoctrination. Christian play school, madrasa in Pakistan, um, and also Jewish kids today. And these, I think, are problems. And if you look at these two pictures, you see no difference between these two children. None whatsoever. It's what happens after they're born. We've got to teach our children together. My favorite photograph from my um, workshops is this one. And I think unless we learn together, our children, whatever their race, whatever their color, whatever they believe, unless they are taught in the schools together, then we'll have more and more problems in the future. Here is one with regard to science. Dayton's creationist inheritance spans the generations. The science teacher at the local high school shares the creationist views of his students. The law as it stands requires Joe Wilkie to teach evolution only, but it's a struggle. The young people of Dayton hold tightly to their belief in the Bible. Unable to deny the word of God to his students or himself, Joe Wilkie walks a thin line between science and religion. Creationists like to be lumpers. They like to put a lot of organisms together in a group. Evolutionists like to be splitters. They like to set off a whole bunch of different organisms. An evolutionist says 
that there's natural reproductive boundaries out there that prohibit dogs, wolves, coyotes, foxes from reproducing. I believe that I give the evolutionary view equal time, and I believe I give it a fair shake. I know a lot of people are powerful. All right, you got your supernatural, which would be God, and he actually, like, he said that he put us here and then put all the animals and plants and stuff to make us survive. How could I say to a student, your ideas are trash. Keep them out of this room. I don't want to hear them. We don't want to discuss that. Supernatural believe he being. Well, okay, well, I think you've seen enough. Has to use a natural product. With regard to teaching of, of evolution, um, and uh, but there are other problems. Some are, are really uh, a little bit more serious, it seems to me. And this is one. It's I was always problem. shit at, 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 at mathematics. I was never ever good, and I don't care. I don't give a shit. <laughs> Algebra was a mystery to me. Connolly, 1A plus 1B. <laughs> you take the piss right from it. You can't count letters, you can only count numbers, silly. Unless, of course, I was absent. The day we did the B times table. One B's B, two B's is a couple of B's. <laughs> Three B's is a couple of B's, plus the one we spoke about in the first place. Well, you know, that's Billy, and uh, of course he's very funny. But in fact, the B times table is actually quite useful. And uh, as I pointed out in one of the previous lectures, two times three is equal to six, and three times two is equal to six. But A times B is not equal, necessarily equal to B times A. And if you want to understand See, if you want to understand the beauties of the universe, you really do need to look at algebra, um, which he goes on to really give a hard time. And you might actually think, if, uh, how many of you are going to be teachers, as a matter of thinking about being teachers? Can you imagine having little Billy in the back of your class? Okay, it must, it must have been hell for his math teacher, there's no doubt about that. But where does it become serious? It becomes serious because, for instance, there are lots of people who are very important to you personally who actually are not able to put the decimal point in the right place. They may get it out, so you might get 10 times too much a medication or two t 10 times too little. If you're lucky, you might be out by two or three decimal points. In fact, one of my friends was in the hospital and he heard one of the nurses talk to him whether how many milliliters there were in a microliter, okay? It could be out by 10 to the 6. So those are the issues. And a lot of people die because of, of uh, problems and mistakes in hospitals, and a large number are due to the calculation mistake. It has a name, the calculation mistake. Now, Kapper, as I mentioned before, said I'd like to see a different emphasis on teaching of science, an emphasis that would reflect the truth that the sciences are different from nearly all other subjects taught, from languages to music, etc. These things are so because man made them so, whereas science is very different. These things are probably so because of this and that, because we did experiments and things of this nature. And the student, he says, will become a scientist by asking questions. Who says so? How do we know? How can I trust what you're telling me? These are the sort of issues that we need to address. And that is what, what, the way that I hope you will bring up your children. Not to accept what you say, but ask you a question. Why are you telling me this? How can I believe what you, the parent, are telling? How can I believe what you, the teacher? How can you, Harry Crote, how can I believe what you are telling me? All right? That is uh, the way to bring up children, it seems to me. Now, some time ago, I set up the Vega Science Trust, okay, and we have some fantastic people, Max Perutz, who determined the structure of hemoglobin. As you're sitting here in this room, he discovered that it changes shape because it's got to be a very sophisticated molecule. It's got to grab oxygen in your lungs where there's plenty of it, and then 
take it to where it's needed, and then let it go. That's a very tricky piece of chemistry to do that. We have four fantastic lectures by Feynman, some of which you, I've shown you. We developed some scientific discussions, and we pioneered a new concept in TV debate that participants should actually know something. <laughs> we have discussion programs, lectures, snapshots, day in the life of a young scientist, really careers programs, interviews with Nobel Prize winners, reflections, workshops of that kind, and science workshops for young children. And these are, we deal with issues. For instance, the embargo on DDT is, was responsible, is responsible for the deaths of about a million children a year. DDT was the most powerful weapon we have against the mosquito. And I've got probably loads of DDT, and we had it all over the house, and I'm still alive. Perhaps it's a good or bad thing, I don't know. But anyway, I don't think that anyone has died from DDT. Um, and I think the, apparently the research on the pelicans, the brown pelican, has been subject to some discussion. But it's worth thinking about that a decision made in this country, the USA, was responsible for the deaths of something like a half a million to a million young children in Africa every year. So those are the sorts of things we've done. We have also uh, interviews uh, by, with Joseph Rotblatt, who won the, the Peace Prize, and he really did deserve it because he spent most of his life trying to uh, stop the proliferation of nuclear weapons. So if you want to see some good programs, I would say that, but they are actually vaguer, Doc or dot UK, but Vega Science into Google. Okay, teaching. Well, let's look at one or two of our films of what you as a teacher, I hope, would try to achieve. Since a serpent did that, uh, any electricity which is started off in there will stay there. And here I've got a magnet. We've got a very good chance of um, making it see its own image. In other words, the magnet as it starts to generate small electric currents in that superconductor, we'll see an image of itself. So if I were to put the magnet down there and spin it, wow. you'll see I've actually managed to get that levitated. There is and actually there a is. gap between... There is a gap. If there. I lift it up very carefully, you can look right through there mm -hmm. and see the people the other side. What's going on? And it's sitting there. Well, it sees an image of itself. Yeah. So it's actually supported on its own magnetic field. Yeah. That'll carry on spinning, yeah. But you see, that was the Meissner effect. And now what I'm trying to do is to turn it over and you can still see through it and it's still spinning. And that's what's known as the reverse Meissner effect. That kid laughing and really enjoying something he'd never seen before is what science is about and can be about. As far as careers, we have careers programs, okay. And here is one that I, one of my favorites. realize that something's been a big change in this thing. The consumption of the systems down as much as possible. The internal environment inside buildings. Um, I was, in fact, the building services engineer for the GLA building, um, which involved designing all the mechanical systems, doing a lot of work on the facade design, and deciding how we were going to control the building. It's a bit of a juggling act, really, balancing the design criteria that the client sets, trying to keep the... I'm going to stop it there, because we've I don't want to run out of time. There are a lot of other things I want to talk about. We have small children's workshops, and we've done these all over the world. I mean, basically from Santa Barbara to Mexico, Shanghai, Malaysia, Japan, Florida, Australia, UK, with Diego Forlan, um, who was then work, uh, playing for Manchester United. And these workshops are very easy, and I've done them here. In fact, I did them with the, uh, the football team. Um, the American football team, let's, oops, I guess that started. Go back, sorry, one back. It's this one. Thank you. 
was my interpreter. It was all in Spanish. And in fact, we had one on Saturday and someone in, in the audience, two, a couple of people, yeah, came along and helped me. And we're going to have some more. So if anybody wants to help to actually teach these little kids algebra, hopefully, or their B times table, let me know. Okay. It became a platform for the science community. And we have lectures on there. Uh, we have short programs as well. But the second revolution has occurred. And for me, it's the internet. And in fact, I've gone by internet now maybe 20, 30 times. I went by internet, internet to Iceland. I, mean, I couldn't go. I'd have loved to have gone to Iceland, but I just couldn't go. But I went there, and here are the photographs of the workshop to kids in Iceland from here at Florida State. So you're living in what I call the Guyu Wiki world, okay? Okay. These three companies, together with others, such as Microsoft and others, have revolutionized things. Encyclopedia Britannic, how many have looked at an encyclopedia? Put your hand up if you have. This week. All right. That's the thing. This year. Yeah, two people, right? Anyway, that's what I was faced with, okay? Not too imaginative. But if you go to Google, put any of those into it, you'll see pages and 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 you'll even get rotating buckyballs. Okay, so that's a rev and it is revolving and it is a revolution. Okay. It's a triple revolution. A paradigm shift in seeking, finding and accessing it. You can create your own material, put it on YouTube. And this I think is one of the greatest achievements of all. It's Wikipedia. In the sciences, it's very good. It's continually being improved. In fact, in my field of molecular spectroscopy, it is a lot better than a number of the textbooks. I think in other areas, it may be contentious. And what we're doing here at Florida State, with other universities throughout the world, is creating a global cache of URL links of what I would call as Wikipedia Mark II. Okay. So you've seen the encyclopedias, okay. What are the problems with GYON? We need to fight back, okay? There are problems, as we've seen, because all that stuff I showed you was on the internet, okay? It's out there. You have to help to educate the kids all over the world who, are, who need your vision, your experience, and you can do that. And we've just got from President Barron, just a few months ago, 70K, an extremely generous gift, to actually create a new purpose-built studio for you to actually help in that exercise. What are we doing? Well, we've got basically a computer that synchronizes the video with the PowerPoint. I don't need to be here. I, I could be just a little box here, like Punch and Judy, and you'd watch the screen, okay? It's the future of broadcasting, as far as I'm concerned, okay? There you go. So we can do this, and you can help to do this too. It's Geoset. Dot info is a gateway site, geoset.fsu.edu is the one that's here. We've got a little short presentation on maps and algebra. Okay, could you believe it? Well, how do I teach algebra? Take a box, and Richard helped me to do this, did you not? Yeah, on Saturday. In, in two minutes, a six-year-old can learn algebra, and Billy Connolly can't learn it at his old age, but he's making a lot of money. Okay. <laughs> Letter F, faces are six. How many corners? Okay, C is for corners, eight. How many edges? Twelve. And then we introduce them to an equation. Okay, Those are best. that's all there is to algebra. Six plus eight minus twelve. Six-year-olds can tell you that it's two. We've got undergraduates here who are doing a fantastic job. Okay. Here are the Beatles. George, John, Ringo, and Paul, we all know their music, and most of us even know of their impact on the world today. However, whether we realize it or not, we've had more contact with another type of beetle, and they have had far more influence on our very lives. And I'm talking about these beetles, the insects. And this presentation will be all about the wonderful world of beetles. So why talk about bugs? They seem so ins insignificant and so unimportant. <laughs> seem so arbitrary and no one knows what they're for. In, actu in actuality, they do know what they're for. These specific examples are for mating and defense of your territory. Now, another example of a diversity of beetles are the fireflies, like this little bugger right here. If you did not realize, fireflies, also known as lightning bugs, are actually beetles. 
and they use a process called bioluminescence in order to produce light. I'm sorry, there. I'm sorry that uh, there's a problem of a match between my computer and the, and the projector, which is something we've not yet solved. But we will try and solve it. So that's an undergraduate, okay? But, okay, let me get into that one. Okay. This is an amazing story, and I want to share it with you. Jennifer found this incredible story. Recently, the first case of inbreeding that was scientifically linked to deformities in animals was released. This study was done by John Vucetti and Ralph Peterson with the School of Environmental Science at Michigan Technology University on a population of wolves, a very close relative of the dog. The study was conducted on a small, isolated wolf population located at Isle Royale National Park in northern Lake Superior, Michigan. The three packs are comprised of around 24 wolves, all descended from one female and one or two males who crossed an ice bridge from Canada during an unusually cold winter in the 1940s. Since then, they have been isolated on the islands that make up the Isle Royale National Park. I'm going to stop it there. She's found this study of wolves that have been trapped for 70 years. They, that, they, you couldn't set this up now. You could not do this study today. But they were trapped and they've never been able to get off the island because the ice hasn't formed. And I want to just jump on a bit to, to the results, if I can do it on here, which is a bit tricky, because I want to show you the, the... This graph shows the vertebrae defects in relation to the estimated birth date of the wolf. The number of deformation, deformities seems to increase significantly during the late 1980s. Buchetti and Peterson noted that for the last 12 years, every one of the wolves they found dead had some sort of bone deformation. Again, in this photograph, you can clearly and compare and contrast the deformed The photograph on the left-hand side is what a normal wolf vertebrae should look like. And this photograph on the right is the defected vertebrae. I guess she now puts her own spin on it. I realize that probably not that many people are inter interested in conservation biology, but where this subject hits home to many is in their puppy dogs. The idea that inbreeding causes deformities in animals is an issue between animal lovers and breeders. Recently, breeding facilities that produce purebred puppies in large quantities, called puppy mills, have been charged with selling unhealthy and defected dogs. You can do this now. We've got a studio ready for you to do this. But it's not just what giving. It's actually quite useful for you yourselves. Um, I haven't got time. I want to show you one graduate student. Hi, my name is Carrie Gilmore, and I am a graduate student here at Florida State University. I work for Dr. Al Bugan as a, an organic chemist. Now, I love organic chemistry because it provides the opportunity to go through and be an architect, an engineer, a builder. Because you can go through, and we can really look at designing molecules. We can figure out how to actually make these molecules, and then finally, we actually get to go into the lab and actually build these things. Now. The greatest organic chemist by far is nature. Nature can go through and take something as utterly simplistic as these small seeds and through a series of organic transformations using chemistry that we ourselves use, uh, it's able to go through and transform into these beautifully complex and beautiful flowers that you can see here. Now, what we do is much the same. We'll take something relatively small, something relatively simplistic, and through a series of transformations, we need to figure out how to make something that's much larger, much more complex. And so that's a graduate student. I want to show you a historical archive that was made here with one of your professors. Hello. We're trying to introduce to you today just a, a single first-hand account of the wonders of penicillin, the name you see on the screen there. It's uh, quite difficult to remember nowadays that a long time ago uh, many many people died from infections that now we would consider to be completely curable and there's a, a, a statistics there that maybe oh dear there's a typing error as well 600,000 deaths uh, in the Civil War in the United States maybe half of those caused by bacterial infections which nowadays we would find should be completely curable and we got used to the fact that penicillin and similar antibiotics are all, always available. And we got used to the fact that penicillin and similar antibiotics... Until about 1935, when this family of drugs were discovered, there was nothing to help in treating bacterial I'm illnesses. I'm going to jump on because I want and to see this bit. In uh, early 1948, uh, 
in order to, at that time we decided that we would go to graduate school in Madison, Wisconsin, which is a lovely place, I have to say. And uh, during that period, I was working as a technician, a uh, chemical technician in a private laboratory. And one day, uh, just about three days before I was, we were to make this trip to Madison from Chicago, I uh, burned myself on a laboratory hot plate. Uh, I took a, quite a piece of skin off of one of my knuckles. It seemed to be healing okay, but unfortunately, uh, about the same time the water pump on my 1941 Chevrolet packed up, and since it was essential that we have the car to go to Madison, uh, I changed it. And in the process, I knocked the scab off, got a lot of uh, filth from the engine in it, and uh, became infected. Uh, it was seemed like an ordinary kind of thing. I didn't worry too much about it. But as we drove north uh, toward Madison uh, of a Saturday afternoon, my hand began to swell, became very painful, and uh, we stopped that on the way to Madison in a little town about halfway between Madison and Chicago, and they treated me with one of the sulfonamides. Uh, they said it probably won't do any good. <laughs> Useful. <laughs> and, and that I should go to the general hospital, the large uh, university hospital in Madison as soon as I got there. Uh, by this time, I couldn't put my arm down. I had to hold it up like this. And I was a red streak beginning to move up my arm, indicating uh, that I had a severe case of blood poisoning, bacterial infection. Uh, I went to uh, the hospital the first thing the next morning. Uh, and uh, displayed my problem to the, the doctor at the emergency room. He said, I think we can fix that. He said, if we can't, we're going to have to take your arm off, which uh, was a bit of a shock, I might say, uh, since it was the one I write with. Uh, he sent me across the street to a pharmacy, and I purchased, uh, I, of course, can't remember the size of the dose, but it was a fairly large amount of, of uh, uh, a material which when I returned to the hospital he injected in my butt. Within, I, 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 I recall minutes, but probably that's an exaggeration, within a reasonably short period of time one could see the uh, red streak retreating back down and by the next day I seemed to be completely cured of the infection. So it was a case of having this drug available to, to me that I now still have a right arm 85 years later. I thought you'd like to hear that. This is one of your professors here. And so we have this technology around that you can actually add to the history, important history. Well, we also have one of my colleagues here, and I want to show you. And he gave me a secret document. Here we are. Top secret. Now, the problem is, he gave me all this information. X, right before he disappeared, gave me these two envelopes, A and B. Now, according to him, it contains a secret message. That's a secret message written in invisible ink. Hmm, okay. But luckily, he told me that he wrote the instructions down and put them in envelope B. And unfortunately, that also seems to be written in invisible ink. Never mind though, we can work this out with a bit of chemistry. So, 
what would you need for today's experiments? Well, firstly, you'll need some kind of heat source. I'll be using a heat gun, which looks somewhat similar to a hairdryer. But anyway, you'll also need... I'm going to stop it there because Steve is, is the next guy on. And we'll come back to that. So, Steve, are you ready? Because I thought you'd want to see the guy who's running the studio. And we're really very, very pleased that President Barron has been so generous to what we've been doing. Uh, to really make what we're doing so really very simple and straightforward. So, let me just make sure I've got you here. I think it's right there. All right, and I think it's here. All right, Steve, it's all yours. All right, it's nice to be uh, able to give a talk today. And I just want to give you an idea of the kind of presentations we're looking for for our Geoset presentations. So excuse the title, that's all I can think of at the time. So, as you can tell from my accent, I'm not from round these parts. I'm from the United Kingdom, uh, especially London. And the first thing you've got to know about us people from the United Kingdom is that we're especially fond of tea. Yes, there's nothing better than a cup of tea, ten past five in the afternoon, with toasted tea cakes, crumpets, and so on. But the other thing that we're really, really passionate about is queuing. We will queue for anything, given the opportunity. Hey, tomato throwing competitions, bus stops and airplanes, how even given the opportunity, we'll queue to get into our own house. But the real problem, the real problem is our random acts of kindness. Now, for example, need a budding volunteer. You, with the glasses, come down here. Yes, you. <laughs> I hope you have health insurance, you might need <laughs> Just one question, one simple question. What's your name? Rosie. Congratulations, Rosie. You've just won an iPad Mini. Ah. All yours, congratulations. Take a seat. Random acts of kindness. <laughs> but what's the mark of a British man? Eh? What, what really is the mark of a British man? Is it the bowler hat? The rather suave jacket and tie? Well, yes, it used to be. It used to be, but now we prefer to spend our Saturday afternoons watching football matches with our shirts off or damaging anything else in the uh, local community. <laughs> it's a real problem. And our last greatest, uh, greatest part of us is the, the fact that we can cry. We love to cry. We cry very well. None of this like, <laughs> no, no, mm -mm. We have to have deep bass in our voice and just let the tears flow. For example, when our football team plays against just about any other team, we tend to lose. We get on the field, we start sobbing, the stiff upper lip just disappears and we're a bawling wreck. It's a real problem, but it's a real British problem. And of course, Her Majesty. Ah, oh, so fantastic. Look at those eyes, eh? Absolutely wonderful. She does a lot for us and we really do appreciate her and her family, except when the uh, camera crews are focusing on the door waiting for a baby to appear. But don't mess with the Queen, really. Don't mess with her, because if you do, she won't be amused. And that's probably because there are some really weird laws still in effect. For example, it is absolutely illegal to die in the Houses of Parliament. Yes, it's true, it's still in effect. If you do die in the Houses of Parliament, well, it'll be an offence to me, offence to the people of the United Kingdom, associated territories, and also an offence to the Queen, so don't do that. A pregnant woman can legally relieve herself anywhere she wants. Be it your home, be it your car, anywhere she wants. <laughs> and of course, my favourite, in York, excluding Sundays, of course, let's be religious, it's perfectly legal to shoot the Scotsman with a bow and arrow. <laughs> Very nice. Okay, let's skip all of that stuff. I went to Sussex University when I did my uh, degree and PhD. I hooked up with this, this guy over there. And uh, then started working on this chemical, which I think you all know of. And then I started seeing this chemical everywhere, I mean, in films, in TV programs. Have you seen the film The Core? There it is. 
Unobtainium, used to save the world. If you're a sci-fi buff, Knight Rider, used as a stress ball. And also the humble foreboding that's Terminator Salvation, plays an integral part in Skynet. It's a real problem for Harry. <laughs> And of course, in Google, we were fortunate enough to have a Google Doodle back in uh, 2010, with a little bucky, spinning buckyball. Then I got started to work on uh, carbon nanotubes, which are the elongated fullerenes, and uh, from then on I started making some electrically conductive paper, so electrically conductive carbon nanotube paper. Flexible paper, which we could be used for uh, solar cells and other applications like that. Hydrogen sensing devices, where we turn on a, a supply of hydrogen and the, the resistance goes up, turn it, on, turn it off, the resistance goes down. So we can de detect hydrogen in small quantities. This is important because if you're driving around in the future hydrogen cars, if there's a hydrogen leak, you really want to be able to detect it. <coughs> Piezoelectric devices, that's basically saying that if we uh, take a piece of material, again, the carbon nanotube paper, add some zinc oxide particles to them, start flexing the materials, we can generate electricity. So you can imagine, say, you know, a pair of shorts, you know, some clothing, you can go out for a run as you're running, you're charging your iPad or your iPhone again. And also one of my favorites, a collaboration over in the Mac Lab, we've decided to make some uh, spider silk molded with carbon nanotubes as well for electric, uh, electrical conductance as well as uh, strength properties. I've also done a couple of books as well, so I'm really getting into the literature side of things, so that's also quite uh, entertaining. But the one thing I really want to say is that the answers that you seek may be hidden in plain sight. And what I really mean by that is that you need to be aware of the things that you see and hear. As a scientist, I mean, you can be highly polarized. You could come up with an idea and you're suddenly thinking, okay, I think I know the way forward. It's going to work like this. I'm going to do it this way, and everybody else is incorrect. And we're just like that plus sign straight in the middle. So if you focus on that plus sign and keep focusing on that plus sign and keep focusing on that plus sign, it's like us scientists. We suddenly begin to imagine things that are disappearing around us and maybe that's not the case, but maybe it is the case, but I don't know, I'm just not sure. We just gotta be able to figure out what we're doing. M make sure that we look around and understand everything that we see. But there is no greater example of things that you see and you hear than the Wilhelm scream. <laughs> Who knows what the Wilhelm scream is? Okay, so for the rest of you. Back in 1959, there was a film released called Distant Drums. Now this film would have been consigned to history like most films at the time. If it weren't for a group of soldiers partway through the film that were busy wading their way through the Florida Everglades, and one of the soldiers had a rather unfortunate encounter with an alligator. Now let's just say it didn't go too well for him. But during this process, he let out a scream. Okay, so it's not exactly a manly scream. But it is a scream nonetheless. So, a couple of years later, there was a film produced called The Charge at Feather River, where a certain private Wilhelm was busy with his pipe and he got shot in the leg with a bow and arrow, with, a, with an arrow. Now these things do happen, of course. So Hollywood took that scream and now are using that in most productions, TV adverts and so on. So, every time somebody gets shot in the leg with a bow and arrow, every time somebody walks down to a car and unfortunately explodes in their face, these things do happen. <laughs> or, when you go off to the edge of a cliff with your best friend and you find that your best friend's dating your sister. Yeah, you get the idea. But for your viewing pleasure and just for the next couple of minutes, I want to show you a couple of examples of the Wilhelm scream. Wilhelm! Yeah, I'll just fill my pipe.
So that's the kind of energy level we're looking for. When you come to us and give us presentations, I mean, don't give out free iPads, that's, that's just me. But yeah, come over to us and we'll, we'll help you out with your presentations. So I'll talk for the last couple of minutes just about the GeoSet project. So GeoSet is the Global Educational Outreach for Science, Engineering and Technology. And this was started off by uh, Harry Croto, as he mentioned, as long with the, oh, as long as, sorry, as well as uh, Colin Byfleet, who's also in the United Kingdom as well. And the premise there is that we could find the best teachers from around the world to help to teach the world. And as Harry said, how do we go about doing this? We use capture station technology, where we take a video feed and a PowerPoint presentation, or keynote, anything like that, combine them together and give a video output that you can watch <coughs> online. Now we have our studios over in chemistry, which uh, Harry mentioned, so you can come over there and do some recordings with us. But in November, in a few weeks' time, we will have a new studio up and running in the Dirac Library. And this is going to be a fully-fledged studio, uh, four main areas. We're going to have a control room for you to just go in and uh, have a go at editing your work and also controlling the, the studio area. We're going to have a reception room with a 46-inch screen, so you can watch your videos or you can you know, come in and watch some movies if you like. You know. We'll keep it fairly flexible, have some tea and discuss some projects, as well as some office space as well. So as I said, this should be opening in a few weeks' time. So what would we like you to do? Um, maybe create a video CV. Maybe this is the future, create a CV, send it off to employers. Or maybe you want to create a video for your CV. We've had a few successful candidates who've recorded some of their work that they do in the lab, some of the ideas that they have, ideas about healthcare, put that into their CV and they've been able to get tenure track positions and, and so on. So it's a couple of the ideas for you to think about. You may want to document your work as well. Uh, maybe your experimental work or come inside and do some music. We try to make the studio soundproof and I say we try, we haven't quite tested it out yet, but I'd like to see what happen if we bring in some recording equipment and have a go and see what happens. But basically, if you have an idea, just come in and let's see how we can try and help you. Uh, Harry just showed you one of my modules from uh, Secret Science. Uh, I create a whole series of modules, chromatography, invisible ink, and so on. You can come and create your own, and that'd be quite interesting. We've also gone into some of the local schools as well. This is one school back in the United Kingdom, where kids ask you know, life-changing questions like, why do frogs jump? We take those questions, we film them, come back here, cut them up, and uh, film a reply to them, and lots of visuals, green screen technology, and so on. So for the new facility, um, the booking system is going to be through the library reservation system. So uh, that should be pretty simple to go into. And we hope to be able to record between 8 a.m. and 1 a.m. And it's not a typo, it really is 1 a.m. So, you know, if you've got projects, you're running late, you want to get them recorded, just come over to Dirac Library and get them recorded. If you want to contact me, Harry, or anybody in the Geoset team, just send us an email to geoset at fsu.edu. We're also pioneering the GeoSet Awards, so there's going to be an award this year for the best video. We're trying to hook up with a few organisations, so maybe a GeoSet Scholastica Achievement Award sponsored by Google, where you'll be able to go to Google and uh, spend the day over there and, and so on. An award sponsored by Microsoft. We'll see what we can. We, sorry, we'll see what we can do with these. And this particular award we gave out in 2011 was, a, uh, was to a group of young students from uh, Central Florida who worked on a Lego project and are contacting Nobel laureates up and down the country. So it's a great little thing to put on your CV. Now we're trying to get a few guest speakers in. Uh, I was over at a conference in, uh, in California, met up with uh, Bill Nye, um, with Robert Sawyer, who came up with the Flash Forward series, which was on ABC a couple of years ago, 
and George Chalmers as well, who was here probably about two years ago. We're trying to bring them all back down here to give a, a couple of talks just for GSZ. So keep an eye on that for the future. And if you're on Facebook, which I'm sure most of you are, uh, definitely go up to our Facebook page and give it a like. We'll get all the information that I've told you today on, on, uh, on there and also give out some press information within the FSU main website. So if you want to help out, uh, come and see us at the end of this presentation and uh, we'll see how we can help you out. Thank you.